I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Tammy Gales, an Associate Professor of Linguistics and the Director of Research at the Institute for Forensic Linguistics Threat Assessment and Strategic Analysis at Hofstra University. She currently serves on the Executive Committee for the International Association of Forensic Linguists. She received her PhD in linguistics from the University of California, Davis, and performed her dissertation research on threatening communications with the Academy Group, the world's largest private behavioral analysis firm of retired supervisory special agents from the FBI. Her research interests cross the boundaries of language in the law and forensic linguistics. Within language in the law, she applies corpus linguistic methods to the interpretation of meaning in, in legal statutes and to disputed meanings in trademark cases. Within forensic linguistics, she applies corpus and discourse analytic methods to the examination of authorial stance in threatening communications, as well as to other contexts, such as the cross-examination of victims of sexual assault and parole board hearings in which certain populations are disproportionately denied parole. She's presented her research at universities such as Georgetown, Yale, and Princeton. She's trained law enforcement from agencies across Canada and the United States and has worked on criminal and civil cases for both the prosecution and defense. It's a real treat to have a prominent forensic linguist of her caliber as a featured speaker in today's event. Tammy, I'll now turn the time over to you. So today, um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for the University of Utah for hosting this conference. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity. Um, for everyone to get together and hear updated research and ways in which both, li both linguists and lawyers as well as judges can integrate um, all of our, our differing knowledge to come together to work together. Um, so this is a, a talk that um, I have been working on with Edward Finnegan from the University of Southern California from USC um, uh, over the past couple of years and what we really want to do with this is look at the different ways that our understanding of linguistics and uh, your all understanding of law kind of come together and help each other, but also sometimes conflict. So we're looking at ways in which we can bridge this gap and bring the two fields together in terms of interpretation and trademark issues. So we're going to be focusing specifically today on issues of genericity and trademark disputes. So the outline for the talk will just do a brief overview of trademarks, um, as well as threats to those trademarks. Uh, we will then talk about some of the parallels, uh, as well as problems between linguistic and legal terms. Um, I will then talk about um, two specific cases where we have used resources, uh, specifically corpus linguistic resources, to investigate issues of generosity, and then talk briefly at the end about suggestions for best practices, which um, we are currently working on. All right, so um, according to the USPTO, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, um, a trademark is a word or phrase basically that distinguishes or identifies the source of goods. So we're not talking about the item itself, we're talking about the source of the item. Um, and here's just some examples with Coca-Cola and Kleenex, Q-tips, et cetera. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you are well aware, there's a spectrum of distinctiveness that trademarks when they're um, applied for get judged on. And so if we look at the first two, the fanciful and arbitrary, those are the, the strongest ways that you can provide a name for your source of goods or service. So here we have fanciful and arbitrary. Um, with fanciful, these are words that are made up and they are applied to a product. Um, these are the, one of the strongest ways in which you can protect um, your, your trademark because they didn't exist before. These are also the hardest ones for new products to use because they don't have a direct relationship with that, with that goods or service. Arbitrary is very similar where you take an existing word, apply it to something that doesn't have anything to do with that application. So here we're looking at things like apple, right? So apples existed as a fruit but when you apply it to a computer, it becomes a completely different meaning. Suggestive um, is also fairly strong. Um, suggestive takes a, a mental leap for the consumer to get from what the product actually is to the name of the product. So a good example here would be Greyhound. 
So we know greyhounds are very fast dogs. So the traits or attributes of, of the fast dog would be applied to greyhound as a bus. So something long, sleek, gray, and supposed to be speedy. Um, and then the last two, descriptive and generic, these are the ones that we're gonna focus on um, today. So these are the ones that are the least protected in terms of, of trademark protection. Um, we're not gonna go into the differences between descriptive and generic too much today, but that's another, another topic that needs um, a lot of discussion. Um, so what we're gonna focus on is mainly this last category, generic ones that do not have a lot of, um, well, generic don't have any protection under trademark guidance. The descriptive ones, as we will see in just a minute, do have some minimal protection. Um, so the issue that we're talking about today is generic, genericization. Um, and this is one of the main threats, there are others as well, but one of the main threats to trademark protection. So the question that the USPTO or um, judges will ask when they're assessing a trademark case is, is a term generic? And there's two parts to this question. So one would be, has a once protected term become generic? And this would be something that was protected at the time uh, because it was new, it was innovative, it might've been in uh, the fanciful or arbitrary category, but has since become generic because it has become so well known as the name for that thing. And Zipper is a good example of that. Um, and it's even harder when the, like with Yo-Yo, the actual object was the first instance of that term. So it's even harder to separate out the object from the source of the goods. Um, and then the second question would be, has it always been generic? And this was, the case, uh, this was the question that was raised in the App Store case that we'll talk a little bit more about um, a little bit later on in the talk. Other threats to trademark protection um, might include dilution, or consumer confusion, um, injury to the reputation, um, but today we're mostly gonna focus on the potential problem with genericide or genericization. So the one instance that I mentioned, and I'll just briefly talk about this, is secondary meaning. This is where you have a term that is deemed not necessarily generic, but it's descriptive. So there's something about the quality of the name that describes a feature of the term, of the name. And this was the case in the Zippy, uh, Zippy versus United States Postal Service case where um, they tried to say that the Postal Service was generic and therefore anybody should be able to have access to that term. And in this case, the court came back and said, no, you know what, even though it might have been originally, it's not now because it has secondary meaning. It's a descriptive term. It describes the good or service. And as of this point, people, the consumers, associate postal service with the U.S. Postal Service. So that is the one instance where um, terms in that lower two categories can get protection. So uh, INTA, which is the International Trademark Association, um, which provides guidance and support for companies wanting to come up with uh, new names, new trademarks, they have what's called the acid test for proper trademark use. And the very first part of that is adjective. So they say that trademarks are proper adjectives, and we'll stress this, they're not nouns, they're not verbs. So mark should always be used as an adjective qualifying a generic noun. So one of the examples they give is Reebok athletic shoes. So in that case, they're considering Reebok as an adjective qualifying the, the common noun athletic shoes. Um, and their acid test also includes components for consistency. So whenever you use a mark, you wanna be consistent in how you're using it. You want it to somehow identify your source in every, in every instance, and you want it to be distinctive. So you want it to stand out, um, one in terms of trade dress, but you also want it to stand out for, from other potential uh, infringers. So these are just some examples of adjective use. Um, so we have the trademark name, we've got Q-tips, cotton swabs, scotch brand, cellophone tape, cellophone tape Kleenex brand facial tissues, and 
the one that I still have to laugh at, and I'm sure many of you have, many of you remember this, um, at least from my generation, when I was growing up, the jingle of Band-Aid, Band-Aid is stuck on me. Um, recently, more recently, they had to add back in the brand, Band-Aid brand, um, in order to protect their trademark because it was at risk of going through that genericide process. So using that identification, they've been able to protect it. Um, and here are some examples of uh, former trademarks that have gone through genericide. So things like laundromat, thermos, escalator, we talked about zipper. And I wanted to put a picture of the Macintosh at the end because what I do think of when I think of Macintosh are the Apple computers, not the long uh, flowing trench coats. Um, that is what this is applied to. So from a linguistic perspective, we have to take into consideration what is an adjective. And so there are linguistic, um, Dr. Egbert talked earlier about um, prescriptive and descriptive grammars. Well, prescriptive grammars, right? Those that are in the rule books, talk about what a characteristic of an adjective should be. So an adjective, it can occur with a noun phrase. So I have examples here, the blue car. So blue in this case would be our adjective. It can also occur after the subject, right? After the subject and the verb. So in this case, the car is blue. Perfectly acceptable use for an adjective. Um, they can also themselves be pre-modified. So we can have an adverb added like very blue. And then finally, they can be used in the comparative forms, right? So we have the bluest car or the most luxurious car. These are all traditional traits of what linguists would consider an adjective to be in terms of its, its functionality and the way it can occur linguistically. Now, I, I wanted to give just a very brief example of what this looks like um, using Google. So in 2012, Google was challenged on their trademark um, by an individual, uh, David Elliott, who said, you know what, I'm gonna register over 700 domain names all using Google. So it was Google Donald Trump, Google Band-Aid, Google Zipper. So he was registering all of these domain names with mixes of protected trademarks. So if we think about um, Google and that list of adjectives that I just went through, we could say the Google search engine. Okay, that, that could work. We've got the search engine is Google. Right, like the car is blue, the search engine is Google. Sounds a little weird, but that works. We generally probably would not say very Google um, or the Googlest search engine. Those are things that we probably would not use. But that list of uh, adjectival attributes is not all inclusive. It doesn't have to check every box. So we want to think of this as, as more of a, a general kind of litmus test of how we're thinking about adjectival use. Oh, and then the most Google search engine, unless you're uh, the, the Doge emoji, which uses adverbs in very interesting ways, um, we probably would not say that. So I wanted to take a look also at Google's own site. Um, after that 2012 case, they came up with a, a, a very, uh, using plain language, so simplified language, uh, uh, rules, of, uh, rules of use for how to use Google as a trademark. And let's Google it. So what they say, just for example, is they say, um, when you're using Google, you should distinguish the trademark from the surrounding text. So they said, use capitalization, use some different kinds of fonts, um, set it aside, set it apart. And we see that in the, the different colors and the stylized lettering um, that, that you always see associated with Google when it's used. Um, they do also say, use the generic term for the product following the trademark. So they encourage people, they say, this is something you should do. They Google search engine or Google search or Google web search. So they're using it as that adjectival form followed by the common noun phrase afterwards. And then the most interesting one, and this is what came up in the 2012 um, trademark case, is they say, use the trademark only as an adjective, never as a noun or a verb. But even on their own site, they frequently uses, use it as a verb. For example, I Googled it. 
which they would say is not appropriate use. Language is messy. Language is complicated and users uh, play with language in a, 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 an amazing variety of ways. These rules, as we know as linguists, and this is getting back to Professor Egbert's um, notion of descriptive language, is we are creative with language. We don't always follow these kind of strict rules. So as linguists, we wanna think outside the box and we wanna think about how are people actually using these kinds of trademarks or what may or may not be a trademark, what might be generic use. So for linguists, we approach the, the notion of trademarks as a noun, a proper noun. So we look at things that are different between proper nouns and common nouns. And that gives us a better sense of how consumers of any particular product or service is using that particular term. So does the term behave like a name, which would be a proper noun, or does it behave more commonly like a common, a common noun? So linguistic behavior, we already talked about the linguistic behavior for adjectives and Google did check off some of those, but let's look at some of the, the behavior for nouns. So when we're thinking again about the traditional categories of uh, grammar, we're going back to that prescriptive notion of language, with a proper noun, um, it's been identified that proper nouns can be complete noun phrases themselves. So you don't have to just think about substituting it with uh, your own name. Um, they're not generally pluralized. They don't have an article like the or an before them. They don't frequently go through the process of some uh, functional shift, which is changing different parts of speech. So we wouldn't have something start as a noun and go to a verb, for example. And they're frequently written uh, with the first letter being capitalized, right? All of those are things that we associate with proper nouns. Common nouns, on the other hand, um, they can be inflected. We think about being able to make them singular or plural. They can come after an article like an or the. Um, they can be substituted by a pronoun and they can be modified. Now there's obviously some crossover between these two categories. And as we saw with adjectives, we play with language. We are descriptive in the use of language. So we don't always follow these exact rules. They can definitely give us guidance when we're going into an analysis, um, but we need to be aware that there might be some variations on this. So when we're thinking about the legal versus linguistic questions um, going into a trademark case, given these uh, grammatical kind of backgrounds, Lawyers generally will ask, is X generic for a particular product? Um, when we work on cases, this is the, the main question that is brought to us when it, it's an issue of genericness. Linguists will then take that question and say, well, we have to think about a range of other things. For whom is it generic? So it's not gonna necessarily be for the entire population. Um, a good example is Coca-Cola. So in the, in the South, and I'm not sure if any of you are from the South right now and you have experiences with this. Um, just think, for example, what you would call something that is a fizzy drink, right, in, in a can. Uh, many people will call it soda. Uh, a range of people, especially in the Midwest, where I am from originally, uh, will call it pop. And then in the South, very oftentimes they will call it Coke as the generic term. This is very specific to the South. So if you went to a restaurant and said, oh, I'd like a Coke. Okay, what kind of Coke? Well, I'll have a, I'll have a seven up. So it's, you have to think about for whom is something generic? What is the relevant population to answer the question that is being brought to you? Um, because there might be different answers. So in what time period is X generic? So things change over time and this might relate back to the issue of secondary meaning. So if, for example, something started out seemingly generic, but not generic enough for the USPTO to say, oh no, it, we think it's descriptive, we're gonna, we're gonna give it some protection. After five years, uh, if it has had association with that particular um, source of goods, it can then be protected. So time periods does make 
a difference. And then more context, as we will see in one of the examples that I'll give you. Context can make a big difference. So in one particular situation, um, maybe from users of, um, sorry, I was thinking about a particular example, um, users of a particular product, uh, say dish detergent, those who have a dishwasher might associate a certain kind of product with something very generic, whereas those who have never had a dishwasher would not. So we have to think about the context in which um, our language is being used as well. So to go back to one of our central points about corpus linguistics, um, there's a range of ways in which corpus linguistics can be used. And we've heard about um, two different ways in our talks uh, previous to this. And this is something that as somebody who focuses on corpus linguistics as a, a methodological approach to linguistic analyses, um, as Professor Egbert said earlier, it is very important that linguists are involved in these kinds of analyses. So an empirical form, corpus linguistics, you think of this as an empirical form of analysis. Um, it relies on large quantities of real world instances of language, and we can look at trends. And that's one of the biggest points with trademark cases. And we can see in ways in which people actually use and produce language. So some of the sample language resources, um, many of which here are big data. And so there's, we would want to compile things into representative samples and there are ways that we would create these to further um, hone them as corpora, right? To make sure that they're representative of those questions we were asking earlier. But corpus-based dictionaries, uh, we might look at um, the former BYU, now English corpora from, that Mark Davies created. Um, and we heard about the, the ones, the statutory ones and the legal language ones currently being created at BYU. Um, Newspapers.com, uh, we might have LexisNexis or uh, different kinds of resources that allow us to see real language in use consumer reviews, Google Trends. So all of these can be drawn on. We wanna make sure that when we are drawing on these resources, we are using them in a scientifically grounded way um, that we are highlighting the representativeness of the language that we are looking at. So I'm gonna just briefly talk about two cases um, to, to sum up this part. So the first one is the question of App Store. So this was a case that was brought, let's see, it started in App Store, okay. Apple applied for trademark protection in 2008. Um, two years later in 2010, Microsoft said they had filed an appeal with the US um, Patent and Trademark Office saying that's generic, they shouldn't be allowed to trademark App Store. And then a year later, Amazon came in and said, uh, we want to apply for um, our own trademark. So App Store for, for Android App Store or App Store for Android. And Apple then said, no, you can't use that because we are trying to trademark App Store. So there was a, a big debate about this. And the central question was, is App Store generic? So we can ask some of those questions about the prescriptive uses of these instances, right? Is it capitalized like a proper name would be? Does it have a, an article like an or the before it? Can it be modified? Is it pluralized? Can it be used as a standalone noun, standalone noun phrase? So all of these things are ways that we can um, examine large quantities of data to see how users are actually using it. So um, in this case, we started with COCA, which is the corpus of contemporary American English, and looked for App Store. So with the asterisks right now, it could be App Store or App Stores. It allows for both. Um, and then we also searched for the single word App Store to see if it was also being used as a, a standalone single phrase. And in the initial search, it was from 2009 onward. And this is at that point in millions, um, it was over... 520 million words at that point. It's now, COCA is now over a billion words. Um, and we found mixed results. So 2009 onward, remember this is right around the time that Apple was submitting their trademark um, application. So we found mixed results after that point. 
right? We had some that were capitalized, some that weren't. And there's some examples here of that. Um, some that were pluralized, some that weren't. And we've got some of those here. Um, some that had, that were attributed, the majority were attributed to Apple. So they had something like Apple's App Store or go to the iPhone App Store. So something related to Apple. Um, but there's also some that have other attribution as we'll see on the next slide. Some had an app store, some had the, and mostly were two words, although there were some single word uses as well. Um, one of the things that is important though, again, to think about when we're doing trademark cases is, is this something that could have had secondary meaning, right? So we looked at um, 1990 to 2009 to see if there was use beforehand that was specifically related to Apple. So, Prior to this point, um, there was <laughs> there basically was nothing up until 2009. So there really was an advent of using App Store when Apple an announced the launch in 2008. Um, we found no instances of the single word App Store or pluralization. So it was just the singular App Store. And there were very minimal instances of lowercase or non-natural at Apple attribution at this point. So at that point, it really did seem like it was an Apple entity. Very quickly after that, as we saw in the previous slide, we started seeing things as early as 2010, and I'm not sure if I have it in this slide. Um, we started seeing things that looked more generic in terms of lowercase and pluralization and other attribution. So here we have the Zune app store. Um, I don't know if Zune exists anymore, but at that point, Zune had an app store. So we're seeing these other kinds of attributions. So this is one way to think about if something may or may not have secondary meaning at that point. And in this case, many people came on, the, on board and said, uh, while it, it could have been maybe a trademark at that point, uh, it was the most common or generic way to describe this. And a lot of different companies started using it after this point. So that's something we can see through a, a detailed corpus analysis. All right, the second case, um, and I'll just talk about one aspect of this case is, is overhead door generic. And this was a case that um, both Ed and I worked on in a variety of capacities. So I just, in this case, I wanted to highlight um, the fact that it's really important to think about the corpora you're using and selecting a range of corpora to investigate meaning. So in this case, um, and you can think about in your own minds, I had to ask the question when this case was first brought to me is what is an overhead door? I, I, that was not something that was part of my, my linguistic repertoire. Uh, I did not know what that referred to. So you can think about whether or not you would use that as a generic term or if you have to question what it might be. So when we got the case, um, we separately looked at a variety of different um, linguistic resources. So COCA, the one that we were just talking about, which had a ton of hits for App Store, did not have very many hits for Overhead Door. And when we looked at it in COCA, it was primarily things like uh, mixed use. So it might have been an overhead door in an airplane, right? So the overhead bins were called overhead doors. Or if you remember Jurassic Park, that example was in there where the little girl hid in the kitchen cabinet and she pulled the overhead door down over her. That was in here. Um, and then some of them are overhead doors in a garage. So doors that go up and overhead, right? So we had a, not that many hits, but a range of contacts. Interestingly though, when you look at a different corpus, we're seeing in newspapers.com, it's very, very specific almost every single time across the board when they're talking about a warehouse or industrial use, uh, when they're talking about a garage door, they're talking about something that goes up and overhead. So in this way, we can present uh, the, the lawyers we're working with a very robust, well-rounded picture based on our corpus analyses of language and use in, if for different audiences, in different uh, situations of use, what we call registers. Um, and we can really provide a robust picture of um, the question about genericide or genericness. 
So I'll conclude by just briefly mentioning um, one of the things that Ed and I are working on right now is thinking about codes of practice. So best practices when linguists and lawyers work together in these kinds of cases. And many, many organizations have existing codes of practice. Linguistics has been supplementing a lot of what we're doing with forensic linguistic work. Um, the Linguistic Society of America and the IAFL, the International Association of Forensic Linguists have come up with codes of practice um, for working in these kinds of legal contexts. Um, four maxims that we're highlighting is that linguists are language experts. And Professor Egbert talked about this at the, in his talk as well. We're, we're language experts, we're not legal experts. So we are going to definitely focus on those aspects of the questions that relate to linguistics and work with you all to discuss how they fit into the legal context. Um, we know that you are advocates for your clients, um, but we are, our obligation is to the trier of fact, the court. So our analyses will be robust. They will encompass um, a range of findings and we will work with you all to figure out how to um, to best package that, but we are going to present uh, the full range of findings. And this comes down to corpus linguistics. So linguistic expert must strive to be objective. We wanna give the best range of possibilities uh, to answer the particular questions being asked of us. And corpus linguistics can definitely help um, as we've seen in statutory interpretation um, in the previous two talks, as well as in trademark cases. And so these are just some things that we have talked about in terms of walking through best practices um, grounded in corpus linguistic work to help linguists um, move forward and follow a, a good framework working with attorneys on trademark cases. So um, I will end there and I just wanted to end with another registered trademark. <laughs> so I appreciate your time and I am happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Tammy. That was really, really interesting. Appreciate that. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in already. Um, here's one. As Google has evolved from a search engine to a more generalized technology company, could Google that is the term Google have developed a double meaning as both the trademark meaning and as the genericized meaning? So that was, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, the, the judge in the case um, looked at the, in the previous case, the 2012 case, looked at instances of the fact that um, Google had been used as a verb and Google itself was oftentimes using it as a verb but it said because it's still primarily recognized as the source of the goods, it didn't take that as being enough to pull the trademark from Google for that, for that sense. So I think what we're seeing is, and the same kind of thing happened with Coca-Cola, right? So somebody challenged um, Coca-Cola's uh, ownership of the trademark saying that, look, in the South, it seems to be a generic use. But again, because it wasn't as widespread, it wasn't the overwhelming consumer population that was using it that way. They have been able to retain their, um, at least as of now, both Coca-Cola and Google have been able to retain their, their trademark protection. So I think it's, it's that balance um, that judges look for in terms of whether or not they're going to say, you've lost your trademark protection. Thank you. Another question is this, this comes from Luna Filipovich, who, um, who was an expert witness for Amazon in the case between Amazon and Apple with the App Store. And, and Luna is asking if, um, why you think the, the Apple lost that case? What? Apple didn't lose that case. Hi, Luna, by the way. <laughs> um, Apple didn't lose that case. So what happened was um, they settled out of court. Um, and so that there was never a decision saying that it's generic or it's not generic. And there was a motion, um, there was a motion uh, for uh, injunction that one of the judges said, I do believe it's acquired secondary meaning. I mean, the analysis that I just showed looked like it probably hadn't had that five-year time period. Um, 
but it was never it was never decided in court in terms of a loss or not. So Apple Apple stopped pursuing Amazon, and then the Microsoft decision was just never decided by the USPTO or by the TTAB, um, the appeals board for the trademark, um, because Apple had dropped the Amazon suit. So at that point, everybody could just use it anyway. Thank you. So um, as we're waiting for other questions to come in, I have one of my own. You talked about trademarks as being either adjectives or proper nouns. Is it possible that they could represent other parts of speech as well? Verbs, adverbs, whatever. Well, I mean, I think we just saw that with Google, right? In the sense that um, we, I'm sure almost all of us talk about Google in a, a verb sense. We verbed the noun. Um, and so we're perfectly comfortable using that. And we do generally know that it goes back to Google as the source of the goods. So I'm sure some of us might go to Bing, right? And say, I Googled something. But generally when we are Googling something, we mean to go look something up on the internet. Many of us probably would go to Google to do it, right? So there's still an association, even if it's a verb, with that primary source of goods. But this is where this is where we see language change. And as that shifts, as people, more and more people are possibly Googling on Bing, right, using it as the generic way to just search something on the internet, we're gonna probably start seeing a shift in terms of the, the protection status. But it's also Google is the primary source right now when you go to the internet. So it's also it's also very dominant in that way as well. But yeah. I do think. Parts of speech are problematic. And as linguists, um, and Ed and I have talked about this a lot, parts of speech are something isn't necessarily an adjective or a noun. Think about compound nouns, right? Is that the compound mm -hmm. noun like a uh, bookshelf or overhead door, is overhead a noun? Is an adjective describing the noun? Is it a compound noun? Um, it, language is fluid and parts of speech are also fluid. So we think more about their function. Uh, so I, I do I do think um, parts of speech, as we just saw here, can definitely be used in a variety of ways that still relate to the source of the goods. Thank you. So one last question before the break, and this is kind of a question for you and Jesse, um, which is, do we really need a linguist to come in and do this sort of analysis, or is this something that that a lawyer or a judge who's become familiar with um, corpus analysis could do on their own? Um, so that's one of the things, and this was part of my, my plenary talk at the, the most recent BYU um, conference in February on statutory interpretation and corpus linguistics. Um, I absolutely think that everyone needs a linguist to be involved in this kind of work. Uh, there's so many linguistic nuances, um, thinking about representativeness. So what kind of data does represent your, your target population? Um, what kind of time frame are you looking at and how do you navigate that within all these different kinds of data sources? How do you balance or weight the different kinds of decisions you're making given the data that you're looking at? Um, there are just a lot of questions that linguists can help with that are um, ways in which we're trained based on linguistic theory, based on corpus linguistics, linguistic analyses, um, based on language variation, um, that we can bring a richer analysis to these kinds of these kinds of analyses that might otherwise be missed or possibly misconstrued if they're they're not done in the, the broader sense. Thank you. That's very helpful.